cow. So I've really been appreciating the consistency in the talks this month that people have offered on the parami of truthfulness. It feels like there's been this collective invitation to really take a truthful look at what's happening within us. And that is always our practice, right? We're always observing. We're always trying to see clearly what's happening, what's here. But this parami and what everyone has shared thus far, I think shows that we're being asked to do that at an even deeper level, to be even more truthful about what is happening within ourselves, looking at aspects of us that we may not always want to recognize or acknowledge or even be with. Susan spoke about really turning toward impatience that was arising during her last retreat. And David shared about uh, looking at resistance he was noticing when he was having to edit a presentation he was giving. And someone in this sangha shared recently about uh, their spouse noticing that may ha they had made a face and their reaction of kind of, nope, I didn't, nope, that didn't happen. And, and then kind of softening and being willing to look at that and yeah. Yeah, that probably was there, <laughs> you know, and, and this is that dimension of truthfulness. And in the teachings, it is said that honesty is the proximate cause of truthfulness. Honesty, being honest with ourselves, being honest with others. And we want to think about what makes that difficult, because it is difficult. And one core layer, um, I believe, is identification and selfing. Right? The ways that the mind takes what is happening, takes what is arising, how we're stirred or how we're reacting to be me and mine and to mean something fun fundamental and definitive about us. And the mind is always doing this, right? It's always building a sense of self, trying to protect us. Right? Oh, I had a good sit. I must be a good meditator. This is who I am. Oh, I gave that away. I must be generous. This is who I am. <laughs> And I think we can all recognize that when we're caught in that, when we take what's happening here to mean something about us, it actually makes it much more difficult to look honestly and with curiosity. Right? And, and then to communicate that without the stickiness of identification. When what is arising doesn't line up with the self that we want to be or who we think we are, my sense is we're not going to be as curious about it. But this is our practice. And for me, I've really come up against the ways that identification and selfing make practicing the parami of truthfulness difficult. It's been somewhat of a difficult last month and a half or so, number of challenges. And in the way that challenging experience are often fertile ground for seeing patterns in ourselves that we may not typically look at, that's definitely been the case for me. It isn't what I would choose, it's not how I would choose it to unfold. But I think we've all experienced how when we're pushed to our edges, we can be kind of forced to see our tendencies and our patterns, the things that we generally may move through life kind of happily blind to. <laughs> and selfing and identification was definitely a thread for me. Um, and I'll share a little bit about it. 
first that initially, as I was facing some stressful things, I really was kind of patting myself on the back for coping pretty well, right? Like all this stuff is coming my way and I'm having to show up for others and it's hard, but I'm grounded. I felt, I felt present and open-hearted and that was true, but you could probably hear the attachment in that identification, right? And I didn't quite catch that. I didn't notice that that was happening. I still just really wanted to be able to do everything and be this person and wasn't quite noticing the cumulative exhaustion and depletion and stress. And one teacher, when I kind of shared with them about this, uh, called it like an avalanche, right? At a certain point, the conditions are right and everything just kind of collapses. And that's sort of what happened, you know. I really just hit a point where there was no energy, very little patience, not a lot of tolerance, right? Even for a pretty mild discussion, all of a sudden I would just be at zero. Um, Or, you know, reactive to how something was washed like any unpleasant stimuli, right? There was not a lot of space to be with that. And the pain of that, you know, which we've talked about a lot together before, the pain of having so much reactivity and irritability and aversion with people I love. And the the pain of that identification, right? Of this sort of, watching my sense of self collapse. (laughs) This is not who I want to be. Why can't I hold more? Why am I not able to keep doing what I was doing? And and that sort of element of shame, right? Shame around that of um, struggling with my health, being depleted, being irritable. This must mean something about me. You know, and I'm I'm sure you can hear how that made it very difficult just to look clearly and truthfully and and to see that these were causes and conditions and not self. Just, I had pushed too hard and for too long and a whole range of things had happened, some that were really unexpected and out of my control And my system was overwhelmed, right? And just in need of some real space to recover. And when I say it like that, it sounds so simple, but it it took a while and it still is taking a while to get there. Like, of course, oh, of course there's irritability. Of course there's reactivity. As Michelle McDonald says, it's not me, it's not mine. It's not myself. Seeing, oh, if that's the case, right, I need to make some choices that are in alignment with that truth. Um, And the more that I was able to kind of open to that, the more the reactivity began to drop because I was able to really recognize, oh, these people, they're not doing anything wrong. I just can't engage and tolerate in the way I normally can. And then the more I've been able to do that, you know, and this is ongoing, I have found myself then able to bring that clarity and that truthfulness to communicate that to loved ones with a little more honesty, right? What I needed could then begin to be named and asked for. And what feels really important and definitely an edge for me is asking for that without the stickiness of selfing, right? Asking for it without the energy of, I need this, but don't be mad at me. Don't be disappointed in me. Don't judge me. 
<laughs> right? If this is just how things are, and it doesn't define me, then there's room for me to ask for what I need or name it. And there's room for people to have their reactions because I'm hopefully not asking them to shore up my sense of self. And again, right, I'm, I'm not out of this. I'm still very much in the process of working with it, but really trying to pay attention to how identifying with what's happening within us, within me, really tightens everything up. It feels like I kind of can't move in any direction. And you might know already kind of the felt sense of that for you, the signs and the cues that identification is really alive and present in you. And I shared a little bit about this talk with Lee. I can see her here. And um, as, as we spoke about it, she really wisely pointed out that the selfing, the identification is part of our practice also. That it's going to happen and we're meant to see it part of this truthfulness practice. And I think that's something that David kind of spoke to, noticing his wish that he wasn't so attached to the words that he had written. That stickiness, right? I wish I, wish I wasn't like this. <laughs> and, and that feels like the selfing of selfing. Right? And in that, we really turn away. We turn away from looking at what's happening. You know, we do identify with what arises. The mind does identify with thoughts and feelings and the energy that's here. And we really want to see that. And so I want to invite us all just to kind of notice that if you're struggling with this parami of truthfulness, if you're struggling to be with what's here honestly, or look honestly at what's there for you, it may be that selfing and identification is at play and that it's making the practice that much harder. And, and then of course the encouragement is how to see that with kind eyes and maybe remember the phrase Michelle McDonald uses, this is not me, this is not mine, this is not myself. Okay, so we can be more truthful with what's here and allow that to inform how we communicate and bring that to others in our lives. So thank you so much for your attention. And let's Let's practice with this a little bit today together as much as we can. So uh, I often find it's helpful just to let all the words fall away also as we transition to practice. Coming a bit more down into the body opening up to any stretches, any movements, maybe even remembering that we have a body. It's alive, it's breathing. Mm. Perhaps a deeper in-breath, a few deeper out breaths, just to invite a little more connection, a little more softening and arriving. And perhaps feel the support of the ground, the earth beneath you. Just 
letting the body naturally come into alignment, into a comfortable posture where we can be a bit more relaxed, also awake and alert, soft focus. and see if there are ways to really connect with and receive the energy in the body as it is now. Maybe certain sensations that you notice, vibration, movement of the breath, heat, coolness, pressure, heaviness, and stay with that as long as you'd like, or perhaps shift maybe to an anchor that feels really supportive to you. Maybe the breath or sounds.
And perhaps in moments as you practice, just as you observe what's arising and passing, if you notice that stickiness of identification, be gently offering toward yourself, dropping in the phrase, this is not me. This is not mine. This is not myself. <laughs> 